Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for the webinar today titled CAR T-cell therapy, current uses and future possibilities. I'm Dr. Sikandar Alawadi, a hematologist oncologist with Mayo Clinic in Florida, Comprehensive Cancer Center. I will be serving as the moderator for today's program. We are very glad to have you with us today and look forward to a great discussion. And now I'm pleased to introduce the speakers for today's webinar. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mohammed Karfan Dabaja, Vice Chair of Hematology and Director of Bo Blood Marrow Transplant and Cellular Therapies in Mayo Clinic, Florida. Dr. R Ricardo Parando, a hematologist oncologist with Mayo Clinic in Florida, and Dr. Hamant Murthy, also a hematologist oncologist with Mayo Clinic in Florida. Today, we will be discussing how CAR T cell therapy is provided, talk about its current uses in treating lymphoma and multiple myeloma and acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and then discuss potential future indications, including for cancers for which there is no treatment. So let's get started. CAR T cell therapy is a new modality of treatment for several hematologic cancers today. There are some broad benefits. For example, patients can actually stop the treatment after receiving it if they achieve success from it. There have been some excellent success stories in patients with different kinds of lymphoma, with multiple myeloma, and also with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. While in some cancers, we are talking about curing the disease, in others, there is significant benefit that we are achieving, even in situations where no options were available prior to the introduction of CAR T cell therapy. CAR T cell therapy does require a lot of coordination and a multidisciplinary team, including, for example, cardio-oncology, infectious diseases, neurology, ICU teams, social work coordinators, in addition to the hematologists who administer and manage the CAR T cell therapy. Because it requires a lot of coordination, it is extremely important for the patients to be referred to the appropriate CAR T cell centers in a timely manner so that we can provide the right treatment to the right patient at the right time. With that, I'll start posing some questions to our panel over here. And uh, Dr. Karfan, I'll start with the first question for you. I've mentioned that patient selection is important to identify the patients who can get any treatment safely. For CAR T, is there any age limit for patient uh, selection or any other conditions that you look for while offering CAR T cell treatment to the patient? So thank you and uh, good uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, that's a great question. In fact, when, when we look at all the studies that uh, have led to the approval of these uh, uh, CAR T products uh, in various hematologic uh, cancers, uh, there was not really a preset age limit. So I would say that uh, for diseases like uh, diffuse large cell lymphoma, mantle cell lymphoma, or follicular lymphoma, as a matter of fact, in those cases, the limitation was most on the meeting the adult age group, so basically 18 or older, but there was no preset limits for, for age. So for us, what's more important is looking at the uh, performance status of the patient, the organ function, and so on. So, But we don't really uh, disqualify patients purely based on chronological age. Excellent. Um, and are there any other uh, patient conditions that would uh, limit them from receiving CAR T-cell therapy in any general health conditions that you're looking for when you are considering a patient for this treatment? So, yeah, that, that's another uh, great question, Dr. Alawadi. I think what is important, uh, if one is to look at this, is really looking at organ function. So, for instance, uh, does the patient have an adequate heart function? Uh, we look at uh, minimum uh, requirements in terms of uh, adequacy of that particular organ function. We look at something called the ejection fraction of the left ventricle. We have to make sure that the patient is not having any a situation like a decompensation of their heart condition and so on. Also, we focus on the lung function of these patients uh, to make sure that these patients are fit to, to move forward. And we also look at other functions such as the liver function, the kidney function, uh, and so So 
we do really a very methodical and extensive workup to make sure that the patient is fit from that particular standpoint. Excellent. Thanks for that comprehensive answer. Uh, maybe I'll pose another question to you then. Um, we hear that CAR T cell uh, treatment is a very complex process. Uh, can you briefly explain for our audience what are the different steps involved in this treatment after the patient has been considered appropriate for CAR T cell therapy? So definitely. Uh, first of all, uh, the procedure can only be performed at centers that are certified to, to perform these procedures. So, uh, and then when the patient is deemed to be eligible for the procedure, there is a process, uh, what is called uh, leukophoresis, which basically is procuring those uh, lymphocytes uh, in order to be able to manufacture the, the CAR T. That is a procedure which basically requires uh, the patient to be connected to a machine called the apheresis or leukophoresis machine, typically uh, taking somewhere between four and a half to five hours. Uh, and then at the completion of that, uh, those cells are shipped to the manufacturing facility uh, that will certainly uh, be manufacturing these products. Uh, this process may take sometimes between uh, 17 and up to 25 or 28 days uh, at, the, at the latest. Uh, then the product is uh, transferred back or, or shipped back to, to, in this case, Mayo Clinic Florida. And the patient will, uh, at that time, be uh, initiated with what we call lymphodepletion, where we need to give a combination of chemotherapies to try to, in a way, open a space uh, for these CAR T cells to go on and home and be able to, to exert the function that is asked of them. So that is kind of the step of the process, the, the lymphodepletion, depending on, on the regimen that is used and depending on what disease or product we use, could take somewhere between two to three days and then... Uh, the patient will go through a couple of days of rest and the cells are infused uh, on the subsequent days. Uh, and this patient will be uh, followed uh, very closely uh, in the hospital setting uh, to make sure that, that the side effects that are anticipated are dealt with in a prompt manner. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, next, maybe I'll ask a question from Dr. Parando. Uh, Dr. Parando, uh, you focus on multiple myeloma. Uh, what are the currently available CAR T cell therapies for multiple myeloma? Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Alawari. So there, there are currently two FDA-approved autologous uh, CAR T cell therapies for multiple myeloma, and they both target a protein called BCMA on the myeloma cell surface. Um, and one of those products is Idacel or Abecma, which is manufactured by Bristol Myers Squibb, and the other product is Siltacel or Carvicti, which is manufactured by Janssen. And both of these CAR T products are approved for multiple myeloma patients who have had four or more prior lines of therapy, so quite heavily pretreated patients. And just to go into a little bit of detail about these uh, CAR T products, so BCMA or B cell maturation antigen, it's a protein that's uh, universally expressed on the myeloma cells, and it's essential for the myeloma cell proliferation differentiation uh, and survival of the plasma cells. And what we're doing with uh, CAR-T essentially is we're pharesing the patient's T cells, as Dr. Carfan uh, described earlier, and we're manufacturing them to express an anti-BCMA antibody on the surface of the T cell so that it can specifically target that BCMA protein on the myeloma cell surface. And Ida cell is a second generation CAR T product, and Silta cell is also a second generation CAR T product, but uh, it binds to two distinct uh, epitopes on the BCMA, uh, you know, giving it more avidity or more, more ability to bind to the pl malignant plasma cell. And, you know, these therapies, you know, they continue to evolve. Uh, right now, they're approved for four or more prior lines of therapy, but there's uh, emerging data that we may, you know, it's also effective if you use it in earlier lines of therapy. So very exciting time for CAR-T and multiple myeloma and, uh, and other diseases as well. Excellent. Thanks for explaining that in detail. Um, Dr. Karfan, I'll go back to you with a question around lymphomas uh, and CAR-T. So there are several different types of lymphomas. Uh, can you uh, touch upon which lymphoma types and what indications within each lymphoma type are CAR T cell therapies available for? Sure. Uh, 
So there are uh, several types of uh, uh, what we call B cell lymphomas. Now, uh, you may be familiar with uh, certainly the B or the T cell uh, type of lymphomas. In this particular case, all the lymphoma approved product target uh, a cluster of differentiation called CD19, which is a B cell marker. So that that is pretty much what all these available products uh, are targeting uh, at the present time. So for diffuse type cell lymphoma, uh, there are three commercially approved products, uh, and those were approved uh, in the third line setting or beyond. So this patient must have failed two prior lines of therapy, and then they basically were treated uh, in that particular setting. The first product that got approved for diffuse cell lymphoma is called Axicaptagen Silolucel, and uh, this product was uh, approved based on a study uh, known at the time as the Zuma-1 study. The second product that was approved is uh, t sachin Leclusel, uh, and this product, again, with similar indications, uh, diffuse albicell lymphoma, whether transformed or what we call de novo or original, uh, started as a large cell lymphoma. And the third product uh, is known as Lysocaptagen Maralucel, Maralucel and uh, that also is another product. Now, based on that success, and to give you a little bit of, of uh, uh, assessing the, the the dimension of this success, is uh, uh, typically patients who have failed two or more lines of therapy with diffuse service lymphoma, the probability of attaining a complete remission to the third line of therapy or beyond is less than 10% in general. And in this particular setting, for instance, axicaptagen cellulosal was able to yield a complete remission rate, which exceeded seven or eight fold above that. So uh, uh, I would say before CAR-T, maybe 7% complete remission rate. After CAR-T, we're seeing in the uh, ranges of 50 up to 55% or so complete remission rate. So, and that eventually translated into uh, improvement in, in uh, what we called overall survival. Based on that success, then the, the second question wa was, well, can we use them at an earlier stage? And there were three randomized studies for diffuse service lymphoma. One was known as the Zuma-7. Another one was known as Transform. And the third one was known as the Belinda study. And Zuma-7 showed uh, superiority to what is considered standard of care, which is a combination of a chemotherapy followed by autologous transplant uh, versus the CAR-T. So axicaptagen versus standard of care was superior, and that led to the approval of axicaptagen silolucel in the second line setting. And that was for patients who have failed to respond to the first line therapy or relapse after uh, within a period of less than 12 months. So those are the patients that traditionally are uh, known to have a very poor prognosis and Clearly, the CAR-T was superior for axicaptagen cellulosal, and the same case was for lysocaptagen maralucel based on the transform study. So these two products, uh, axicaptagen cellulosal and, and uh, lysocaptagen maralucel, made it to that second indication. The third study known as Belinda did not show a benefit for, for t leclusel in this case, and uh, that was not approved for that indication. So we have three products approved for third line or beyond. We have two products approved for second line uh, uh, setting, which basically, as I mentioned, patients who have failed to respond to frontline therapy or uh, have relapsed within less than 12 months. The, the other disease for which there is an indication is called mantle cell lymphoma. And this basically is for patients who have relapsed disease or have refractory disease, meaning they have not responded to prior therapies. And the product here is known as Brexocaptagen Otolucel, again, targeting CD19, showing impressive responses uh, in those patients who have failed all, all therapies uh, before. The third indication in lymphomas is uh, follicular lymphoma. And for this particular one, there are two products that are currently approved. Uh, one is uh, Axicaptagen Cellulucel, uh, this was based on a Zuma study uh, at the time known as the Zuma 5 study, uh, showing that uh, the patients who have failed uh, two or more lines of therapy for follicular lymphoma, uh, those patients showed impressive response rate, overall response rates of close to 90%, and uh, certainly durability of those responses three years later, more than 70% of these patients uh, continue to be alive. And uh, certainly... Uh, 
the most impressive, I would say, is, is there is a group of patients uh, with uh, follicular lymphoma that tend to relapse within uh, 24 months of initial treatment. Uh, it's called the POD24 or 24, and those patients actually, the, uh, the product demonstrated that it is effective even in that group of patients who is, uh, has an aggressive, uh, more aggressive biology, perhaps. The other product is tisagen leclusel, which is also approved based on a study known as the uh, ELARA study. Again, so we have those two products there. So those are the products that we have for uh, patients with, with the various types of, folic- of uh, B-cell lymphomas. Excellent. Thanks for pointing out all of those. And I do want our audience to know that uh, at Mayo Clinic, we are able to offer all of these products in all of the respective uh, indications where they are approved. Uh, Dr. Karfan, you have talked uh, uh, quite nicely and extensively about lymphomas, where um, these multiple products are available across various different uh, diagnoses or lymphoma types. But a third uh, disease area where CAR T-cell therapy is currently approved is acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Uh, Can you tell a little bit about uh, what specific indications for using CAR T-cell therapy in acute lymphoblastic leukemia? Sure. So the the first product that was approved again for keeping in mind that uh, same prior theme uh, of CD19. So the these same products, uh, uh, axicaptagen, uh, sorry, uh, brexucaptagen or tolucel and uh, tisagen leclusel have been approved for patients with uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia of the B cell type. So obviously the B cell is is those cells are the ones that tend to express that CD19 uh, antigen on them. So the first uh, product approved was actually uh, tisagen leclusel. This was based on uh, the Eliana study, uh, is what the name of the study was. And this particular study uh, was geared towards uh, patients in the pediatric and uh, young adolescent age group. So uh, this product demonstrated that it was uh, effective in patients who have relapsed or refractory B-cell acute lymphoplastic leukemia, and the, that product, tisagen leclusel, is currently approved for patients up to 25 years of age. So 25 years of age uh, interpretation is really 25 years, 11 months, and 29 days. And But uh, subsequently, uh, brexucaptagen or tolucel, based on the uh, study known as the ZUMA-3 uh, study, was uh, also uh, had proven uh, efficacy in the adult age group, and that product is approved for patients with B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia who are 18 years of age or older. Uh, And those two products demonstrated that they are able to induce a complete remission, even in patients who have failed the prior allogeneic transplant, which tends to be a very aggressive uh, 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 or a very patient with very poor prognosis. So this is how, how, in my opinion, how uh, effective and impressive these products are on those indications. Excellent. Thanks a lot for pointing that out, because as we started uh, in the beginning or, or mentioned that uh, CAR T cell therapy has revo- revolutionized our uh, treatment options because patients are seeing unprecedented benefit even in settings where the prognosis was very poor, and importantly, we did not have any standard of care treatment options available. Uh, Dr. Murthy, I'll come to you for the next question. As uh, Dr. Karfan nicely laid out the importance of CAR T-cell therapy in ALL, we also know that acute lymphoblastic leukemia, or ALL, is seen more frequently in the pediatric population. Now, the more common uh, uh, acute leukemia seen in adults is acute myeloid leukemia. So, what is the status of CAR T-cell therapy in this diagnosis? Thank you. Or thank you. It's an excellent question, Dr. Alawadi, and uh, good evening, everyone. So in terms of acute myeloid leukemia, you know, we have, there are, there are a couple of, uh, there, are a couple, there are a couple of things that have, that uh, lend itself to be a little more difficult than, than the current indications that we have for other diseases like lymphoma myeloma. One being finding the right target for leukemia, mean, meaning when we look for a target, we want to make sure that it is a target that is expressed by the tumor cells, but not expressed by normal tissue where you may have on new toxicity because of that. Where most of the times with a leukemia, these are part, these are your abnormal blood stem cells, which are responsible for your normal healthy blood count. So, 
finding a pro finding a target has been is is has been a little bit difficult. Uh, the second thing is that with the manufacturing time for, for needed for CAR T, many times leukemia patients, especially with relapse leukemia, may not have that time. So, is there a way to get a product faster, or are we do we need to consider using a different immune cell? So, I and I think there are still other factors like the actual microenvironment that may contribute to to the difficulty. Now, there the trials there are trials that are ongoing. There are they are still relatively in early phase trials, mostly determining safety and trying to see early signs of efficacy. We do see CAR T cells uh, similar in style like the lymphoma, but they target C a marker called CD33. And these are, these are autologous or, you know, your, your own T cells that are being collected and then manufactured very similar to our commercially approved products. Other options that are being other targets, uh, CLL1 is another target that has, that there are a few clinical trials very early or in development for. And that I think is a promising target because we do see less expression of that outside of leukemia cells. Other trials that are, that are ongoing are actually taking advantage of using different types of immune cells. One particular immune cell is called a natural killer cell. And one of the benefits of a natural killer cell is that it, we, we collect it from donors or we don't need somebody's, somebody's own natural killer cell. This allows for us to be able to apply treatment faster when we and and when we can still determine the appropriate target to to harness to encode these NK cells and target the uh, leukemia cells, so I think there is there has been a significant amount of progress. Maybe maybe still a little behind lymphoma, myeloma, and ALL, but I think there's there's certainly a cause for optimism in the near future. Excellent. Thanks for explaining all of those options that are coming on the horizon, especially in this uh, diagnosis of AML that can be quite devastating in the relapse setting. Um, Dr. Harfan, we mentioned in the beginning also that CAR T cell therapy requires a lot of coordination between a community referring physician and the academic CAR T administering center. And that's why we um, uh, frequently um, uh, suggest that the patient should be referred at an earlier time than when they may actually even need the CAR T right away, because we need all of this coordination planning. You mentioned the manufacturing times, etc. But on the other end of the spectrum is when the patient has received uh, the treatment and is now ready to go back, assimilate in uh, their life, their um, back going back home or going back from the CAR T cell center to the community. So what dictates when the patient can actually return to his or her primary oncologist to wherever they got referred from? Yes, yeah, so certainly uh, uh, these patients after they are they have completed that process and uh, normally we would like to keep them in the neighborhood of, of our center here for another couple of weeks. And then these patients will be transferred back to the referring physician. Now, it's very important that there are certain uh, instructions that are uh, coordinated uh, between the, the our center and that referring physician. So these patients, for instance, uh, there is a restriction in terms of driving. They cannot be uh, behind the wheel for at least eight weeks. So that is basically one of the requirements. Second, uh, during that process, uh, proportion of, of this patient may be requiring frequent blood testing to make sure that uh, their uh, uh, blood parameters are within desirable range. So this patient uh, could have what we call pancytopenias uh, requiring sometimes blood or platelet transfusions, and in some cases also what we call growth factor to increase the white blood cell count. So it's very important to keep an eye on those to certainly make sure that the patients are closely followed in the community. Obviously, with low counts, there is a risk of uh, patient developing infections. So it's very important that the patient continue on their what we call prophylactic antimicrobials. They will have to be on certain antibiotics or antivirals for a particular amount of time. Also, this patient will require uh, looking at 
at some uh, markers of immunity, what we call immunoglobulins, to make sure that those are within a certain range to try to reduce that risk of developing infection. So there is a lot of communication with, with the referring physician back and forth, and there will be also the, the process of assessing for response of this treatment. So we'll have to, after a certain uh, time, for instance, in our center, we like to do the radiologic evaluation at one month and then at uh, subsequently to make sure that there is a response. Uh, typically, the prognosis of these patients or the future outcomes, I would say, is very important that, that there is a demonstration of a complete remission as early in the post uh phase as possible. So if a patient, for instance, uh, did not achieve a complete remission on the first 30 days, that is a group of patients that we would like to repeat another uh, PET scan uh, within four weeks of that, so what I call day 60, to make sure that 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 patient have moved into a complete remission if didn't have that type of response earlier, and so on and so forth. And this is important because if, if patients do not achieve uh, these early responses, they will be more likely uh, than others who do to have uh, eventually relapse or progression of the disease. So it's very important because... Uh, we need to act and we need to act immediately if, if that's the case. So there is, as you can imagine, a lot of coordination between our center and those referring centers to make sure that all of those things are, are performed in a prompt manner. Excellent. And and we do provide a lot of that information back to the referring physicians at the time of the patient's transfer. So uh, we really want those um, referring physicians to be um, a partner in managing that uh, patient because um, it, it, it's extremely important. Uh, Dr. Prando, uh, Dr. Harfan mentioned about uh, what criteria are typically uh, need to be met before a patient can be sent back to their uh, referring physician and, and to where they came from. But when we are uh, getting the patient through CAR T cell therapy and its treatment, uh, what are the main side effects of CAR T cell therapy that you keep in mind while treating your patients? And also, what is the um, group of side effects that you keep in mind when you're handing the patient back to the community hematologist so that they can monitor and maybe even reach back to you for guidance if it, uh, if that is needed? Yes, yeah, so those are, you know, very good questions. Um, you know, the, the main toxicities of the currently FDA-approved uh, BCMA CAR T-cell therapies for m multiple myeloma include uh, cytopenias, infections, uh, and then, you know, the main one that we watch out for, one of the main ones is uh, cytokine release syndrome, which is an acute systemic uh, inflammatory syndrome characterized by fever, multiple organ dysfunction, and that's caused by the expansion of the CAR T cells once they're infused into the patient. Uh, you know, when those T cells start to expand, they release uh, other inflammatory proteins known as cytokines, which further activate the CAR T cells, expand the CAR T cells. It activates, uh, uh, you know, other T cells, macrophages, endoth endothelial cells. So it's sort of like an inflammatory chain reaction that can happen when you infuse the CAR T cells. Um, that we monitor for. Uh, another toxicity is uh, neurologic toxicity known as ICANS or immune effector cell associated neurotoxicity syndrome, which can manifest as uh, headaches, uh, confusion, language impairment, uh, fine motor impairment, and even seizures. Uh, patients can have any of those um symptoms, and it's due to the expansion of the CAR T cells and the release of these cytokines, which disrupt the blood-brain barrier, allowing inflammation uh, into the central nervous system. And, you know, with uh, uh, CRS, cytokine release syndrome, and ICANS, you know, uh, death uh, has been reported due to these side effects, but luckily, most of the times, these toxicities are low-grade and they're manageable with supportive care. So for example, for CRS, you know, we use a drug called tocilizumab, which uh, neutralizes a cytokine known as IL-6, which is a key cytokine leading to the inflammation that causes CRS. Um, it's basically an antibody that will neutralize IL-6. And then for the ICANs or the neurologic toxicity, we have anakinra, which is an IL-1, uh, another cytokine uh, receptor antagonist. And we also have corticosteroids, uh, which help, you know, the, uh, the lead to the resolution of uh, this toxicity. 
uh, in patients with multiple myeloma. I mean, 90, 95% of patients who receive CAR T cell therapy, anti BCMA CAR T cell therapy, will have low grade uh, cytokine release syndrome and ICANS. Only a small percentage will have uh, severe toxicity, but it is uh, very manageable and treatable. And then you know, regarding, you know, when, when we send the patient back to the community oncologist, uh, what do we do? You know, Dr. Carfan mentioned a lot of it, and I like to say it's, it's, it's similar to the stem cell transplant algorithm, um, the autologous stem cell transplant algorithm for multiple myeloma patients. So one of the things to monitor for is the cytopenias. You know, the patient may be cytopenic for some time after the CAR-T due to the CAR-T itself and the lymphodepleting chemotherapy they receive. They may need transfusion support, so you have to check labs multiple times a week. Uh, we may have to use growth factors like GCSF or uh, erythropoietin-stimulating agents. And if the cytopenias are persistent after 100 days, you know, luckily in, in myeloma patients, because we've collected for two stem cell transplants, a lot of patients have leftover stem cells that we can use to give them what's called a stem cell boost to sort of replenish the bone marrow uh, and lead to the resolution of cytopenias. And then another uh, toxicity to monitor for are infections. Um, you know, the patients have to continue on viral prophylaxis for at least a year, PCP prophylaxis till day 100. The CAR-T causes uh, B cell and plasma cell aplasia. Uh, and the patients will have hypogammaglobulinemia. They, they're going to need IVIG support to prevent infections. They need COVID and flu vaccinations. And then we do check the titers for the childhood vaccinations. They may need some uh, to be revaccinated again because the lymphodepleting chemotherapy may have, you know, uh, wiped out some of their immunity to, you know, uh, diphtheria, hepatitis B, for example. So. No, that's ex uh, excellent. Thanks for uh, pointing out all these um, side effects that can happen. But as you rightly mentioned, uh, it's important for our patients and our um, physician partners to keep in mind that in majority of the cases, the side effects are low grade. Uh, there's an, only a small proportion of patients where any high grade side effects can happen. And frankly, our management or handling of these side effects has also evolved over time. So we are able to protect them faster. We are able to act on them sooner so that in majority of the cases, these side effects do not become advanced grade. So thanks for pointing that out. I'll, I'll ask you another follow-up question regarding um, multiple myeloma and CAR T cell therapy. So uh, we've, we've heard about obviously these um, excellent treatment options. They are uh, require coordination and we want the patient to be seen at the right time so that we can arrange for it. But in your opinion, how has CAR T cell therapy improved the outcomes or clinical outcomes of patients with multiple myeloma? Yes, so that uh, is a key question. You know, CAR T has tremendously improved the clinical outcomes of uh, multiple myeloma patients. So, you know, in, in the sort of space that CAR T is approved, you know, after four or more uh, prior lines of therapy, you know, patients are what's called triple class refractory. Uh, refractory to a proteasome inhibitor, an immunomodulatory drug, and an anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody, or they're pentarefractory, meaning they're refractory to the five main uh, myeloma agents that we use, uh, lenalidomide, pomalidomide, which are immunomodulatory drugs, bortezomib and carfilzomib, which are proteasome inhibitors, and daratumumab or isatuximab, which are anti-CD38 monoclonal antibodies. So that group of patients, which, you know, by the time you get to four, four or more prior lines of therapy, almost all of them have had all of those drugs and have progressed uh, after receiving those drugs. You know, they had quite a dismal prognosis, you know, in the range of six to nine months. But in that patient population, you know, the patients treated with um, Ida cell or Silta cell CAR T, uh, the, the median progression free survival, you know, ranges anywhere from 11 months uh, with uh, Ida cell to uh, almost 35 months with Silta cell. Uh, and the overall survival is even longer than that. Um, so in this, you know, penta refractory or triple class refractory patient population, there were prior to the advent of CAR-T, there were very limited treatment options. And CAR-T has really uh, tremendously improved the, um, the survival outcomes of these patients. Excellent. And I think in a lot of cases, uh, CAR-T cell therapy for uh, patients with all of these diagnoses is either curing them or controlling the disease very well so that the patient can actually be able to 
get benefit from subsequent therapies that may come down the road or may become available FDA approved um, for subsequent therapy. Now, we've talked a lot about the hematologic malignancies, um, uh, lymphomas, B-cell lymphomas, um, B-cell ALL, and uh, multiple myelomyver CAR T-cell therapies available. But frankly, solid tumor uh, malignancies are overall much, much more common than these hematologic malignancy diagnoses. So, um, Dr. Murthy, I'll pose this question to you. What is the current or future role of CAR T-cell therapy in solid tumor malignancies? I think it's a it's a great question, and I think we're we're still learning about that. We're, you know, kind of similar to the AML story is about having a car that is that finding the right target is one, but also making sure that the car is actually well equipped to fight a solid tumor malignancy. It's it is a different environment for a, for a CAR T to navigate from a microenvironment standpoint than, say, multiple myeloma or or uh, or lymphoma. So there there are some novel techniques that are being st studied and investigated. Uh, you know, we see we have we know that there are some trials that are actually looking at. Uh, at at uh, looking at HLA heterozygosity, basically to make sure that there is a difference between normal tissue and and the tumor tissue, and this way the, the then making a stronger car that will selectively not touch the normal tissue. So that is an interesting concept that is being investigated in in different uh, solid tumors. Other techniques is to use uh, use interleukin therapy and different encoding of the CAR T in order to allow it to to fight uh, to persist long enough to have more effect on the metastatic disease. We've seen we see early trials that are ongoing for breast cancer. Uh, we see trials that are ongoing for colon colorectal lung. So I think there is certainly some some opportunity. There's certainly some excitement there. I'd like to also add that another thing similar to AML, when we talked about using natural killer cells, there are trials that are using other immune cells, such as monocytes and macrophages, which may traffic into the tumor site. So trying to encode the encode and uh, create cars that or car macrophages that may have a predilection of going after these tumors. So there's a lot of different strategies, a lot of different concepts that are being investigated either preclinically or very early in clinical trials. Uh, I, and I think there is some, there have been some promising uh, early results. I'd say renal cell carcinoma has been one, of, one that has had some promising early results. And I think there's still more to come uh, down uh, in the in the coming uh, in the coming uh, future. Excellent. Thanks a lot for pointing that out because that tells us that the uh, future horizon is much brighter. And and frankly, patients across the spectrum of different cancer diagnoses can hope to benefit from these uh, advancements and the CAR T cell therapy has to offer. Um, Dr. Murthy, I will ask another uh, question of you. The next one. Uh, being that we have heard that, at least with the currently available CAR T-cell therapy, some of the barriers can be uh, that CAR T-cells cell, um, cell themselves can take a longer time to manufacture, which means that the patients can sometimes need some bridging chemotherapy in between. Sometimes the disease may be too rapidly growing, and so we don't have the opportunity for the patient to wait for the T-cells to manufacture, etc. So, uh, uh, educate us, is there anything on the horizon to help overcome some of these barriers? That's a, it's a, it's a great question and something that we, we have struggled with, uh, you know, with, with some, sometimes diseases that are, that are rapidly growing. And we, you know, this is a, sometimes these are barriers to getting people to CAR T therapy. So, I think two approaches have really been looked at. I think the first approach was was seeing, do we need to manufacture our own cells? Can we use someone else's T-cells? 
And with the advent of gene editing, ther- uh, gene editing uh, processes, we were we were able to actually edit T cells in order to not in order for the t- for the CAR T to come from a donor, but not give the toxicity that may come from introducing a donor cell, such as such as something we encounter in bone marrow transplant called graft versus host disease. So that was that is one option that has been that has been and being studied in a number of trials. Some of the some of the uh, drawbacks have been that we have not seen these cells maybe last as long as some of the as some of the autologous cells. So I think there is still work to be done in this space to try to get even comparable, you know, if even if we are able to get similar results to autologous, the, the difference in the time makes a difference. Now, more recently, we've seen that many of the uh, many of these uh, CAR T uh, manufacturers have developed faster manufacturing. Uh, you know, one that it was uh, that was uh, recently published by Michael Dickerson in, from Australia was was about T charge for from uh, and with a very rapid manufacturing of a, of the Novartis product. And in in those, that case, the manufacturing was as short as forty eight hours, and CAR T product was available in in about five days. Now, the in, the importance of this is that also seeing how long the T cells from collection to manufacturing, these T cells had increased stemness and may make them more potent than if it takes a long time for the for the T cells to manufacture. Now, these studies were very early. They were done, conducted mostly to demonstrate safety. So longer term studies are necessary to see if the, how effective these are and more importantly, how effective they are compared to the standard of care. But I think there is definitely progress in trying to shorten that time and get these therapies to patients faster. Excellent. Thanks a lot for pointing out. Um, uh, Dr. Prando, I'll ask you uh, the next question. So, um, what are some of the barriers that patients seeking CAR T cell therapy can face generally? I mean, we know that Dr. Karfan laid out that there are um, certain centers that are able to provide this treatment and the centers have to be appropriately certified. So I can imagine patients across the country would have some barriers um, that they may face. So uh, if you wanna mention some of those barriers that patients seeking CAR T cell therapy can face and what is Mayo Clinic doing currently to try and overcome those barriers so that again, the patients can get the treatment at the right time. Yes. So, um, you know, the, the main mar- barrier that exists, uh, you know, for CAR T cell therapy is, you know, the sort of the limited availability of the product, right? Uh, it's not available, you know, on the spot. It's on an off the shelf product. Um, and there's only a certain amount of slots allotted to an, uh, a medical center, right? For CAR T per month. So, you know, due to that limited availability, uh, it can lead to, you know, that's one of the biggest barriers that patients have to overcome uh, to get CAR T. Uh, and, you know, if the patient lives far away from a CAR T cell center, getting into the door, right, for the initial evaluation can be another barrier. Um, and then, you know, wh- when you actually get through the door, right, you have to evaluate the patient, do vital organ testing, you have to stage the disease with the bone marrow biopsy, you have to do the T cell collection and phoresis. Uh, and then the manufacturing process is a little bit longer for the myeloma CAR T's. It can take, uh, you know, between four weeks for Ida cell and uh, up to eight weeks for Silta cell. And sometimes patients are relapsing, right? If they have, uh, if they've exhausted all therapies and they have very aggressive disease like extramedullary disease or rapidly progressive disease, uh, you know, they may not may survive long enough to get the CAR T. Uh, so those are some of the main barriers that uh, patients face when they uh, are looking to get CAR T. But Mayo Clinic is doing many things to to overcome these barriers. So we and so are the companies that manufacture the CAR T products. Uh, so we've recently increased our phoresis capacity. So we're able to, uh, you know, uh, but 
for risk more patients uh, per month to get more patients to CAR T. Uh, we're able to expedite the workup, right? The vital organ testing, the restaging of the disease. You know, most of the time, between one to two weeks, we can get all of this testing done for the patients. Uh, and then, as Dr. Murthy mentioned, you know, the the science of CAR T manufacturing is improving, right? The manufacturing capacity is increasing. They're developing faster ways to develop. Uh, to manufacture the CAR T product, uh, they're uh, devising ways to increase the persistence of the CAR T, right? Because as of now, with the currently available products, you know, over time, the CAR T product may dwindle; it may not persist, right? And you want that CAR T product to persist to continue to to attack the 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 disease of interest. Um, and then, you know, what I always recommend to community oncologists and even, you know, myself with my own patients is, you know, early referral for CAR-T, right? By the time in myeloma, by the time the patient is reaching that third, starts third line of therapy, you know, start referring the patient to CAR-T so we can start future planning. The patient is already in the door. We know the patient. Um and, you know, we start thinking of uh, uh, bridging therapies, right? If the patient has very aggressive disease or is relapsing, right, you need a treatment to keep the disease at bay while the CAR-T is being manufactured, right? So all of that uh, takes a little bit of time and thinking, right? So we want to get ahead of it and do it early. Um, so those are the main things that, uh, you know, the barriers to CAR-T and the things that Mayo Clinic and uh, the CAR-T companies are doing to help overcome uh, these barriers. Excellent. And I think I um, mentioned in the very beginning that a multidisciplinary team comes together at Mayo Clinic to help that patient um, get appropriately assessed to be able to make sure that the patient is the right candidate and is likely to benefit with hopefully less amount of side effects. And, and frankly, if any of those side effects occur, all of those facilities, all of those uh, uh, team members are available to uh, take care of the patient. Um, and I think I, sh I should also point out that uh, the role that our uh, navigators, our coordinators, or our uh, social workers play in overcoming some of those uh, non-clinical uh, barriers that the patients may have, sometimes helping about with uh, figuring out uh, caregiver support, etc. All of those are also extremely helpful so that the patient can really focus on their disease and the recovery path rather than all of these other factors that they get uh, burdened with uh, during the treatment. Um, I'll pose another question to Dr. Murthy. Um, so Dr. Murthy, Dr. Parando laid out some of the ways in which we are overcoming the barrier and our teams are coming together to take care of the patients and, um, and provide them with all the support. Uh, can you talk to us about some of the other uh, characteristics or some of the other um, methods that Mayo Clinic is instituting so that uh, we are providing a differentiated care for patients who are receiving CAR T-cell therapy with us? Yeah, so I think this is something that we are, we've been, as at Mayo Clinic, we've been very much on the front foot about trying to, trying to, to change the model of cancer care. And I, and this is something that is not just unique to Florida, but unique to all Mayo Clinic. And, and, and some of the things we're trying to do is, you know, as we have become more comfortable with our, with the, with managing the cellular therapy, the, the question comes, do we need to, do we need to hospitalize people so much? And, you know, maybe moving these treatments into the outpatient setting. And so that's something that we have, we have embarked on for not for CAR T as well as other immunotherapies. We, we are now in minute, we are now giving the, the CAR T. We will infuse it in the, in the, in the hospital. But then very early, we will let the patient uh, leave the hospital. And we use remote uh, program for remote patient monitoring, where we monitor a patient's vital signs. We monitor them for toxicities in the comfort of their home. Now, imagine now a patient doesn't have to sit, they have to be hospitalized for, for 10 to 14 days, and they can, you know, they can be managed while eating their own food, home cooked food, and sleeping in their own bed. So these are ways how we are trying to move this move uh, treatment 
into a new into a new uh into a new treatment paradigm where we can and and I think there are some implications for this. I think not to patient satisfaction, quality of quality of care, quality of life, and potentially a uh, cost a uh, cost uh, benefit to overall by by reducing the amount of time that patients have to remain in the hospital. So far, they we this is this has been done in all three Mayo sites and has proven to be safe and still maintain uh, efficacy. So I see this expanding. Uh, for for the majority of our uh, of our cellular therapy products and as an integral part of our cellular therapy program going forward. Excellent. Thanks a lot for pointing that out because certainly um, our patients who are receiving their um, uh, CAR T cell therapy or um, stem cell transplant, et cetera, in their home setting and being monitored there, that's a huge quality of life improvement for them. And of course, also, very significantly uh, eases the burden on their caregivers. Um, the the next question, uh, which is coming from uh, one of our audience, and actually I would remind everybody to please pose your questions in the uh, Q and A uh, box so that we can ask our um, panel to give their opinion about these questions. So. Uh, with that, the, uh, one of the questions that has come, which actually I'm going to pose to both Dr. Karfan and Dr. Parando, uh, this is an excellent question that when there are more than one, and I'm going to paraphrase the question so it's applicable both to myeloma and lymphoma. So, uh, Dr. Karfan, first for you, when there are more than one uh, products that are available for the same indication and the diagnosis, how do you help select which should be the preferred agent for that patient at that time? What are the criteria you keep in mind? So that is really an amazing question to which probably there is not a 100% uh, right answer in my opinion. I think that there are many factors that play into this. Number one is the familiarity of the treating physician and the center with that particular product. Second, and and very important in 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 my uh, judgment when I make this decision is really reliability of manufacturing. Uh, which product has the most reliable track record of manufacturing? Meaning, uh, when these products were approved for commercial use, there is a set of requirements that the product has to meet before it can be released for for administration uh, to the patient. Uh, among them would be things like viability, sterility, and so on and so forth of the product. And and obviously that all these products are subject to that type of quality control. But I would say that one important factor, uh, at, uh, speaking from the lymphoma perspective, is really the predictability of manufacturing. Uh, what product has the lowest uh, uh, rate of, of manufacturing failure? That plays a lot. And also the predictability in terms of timeliness of manufacturing, which product tends to have a much more sustainable track record of having timely manufacturing. And this is important because uh, when a patient has failed several lines of therapy and you are waiting out there uh, for this manufacturing, uh, every day counts. And uh, there, this could actually make it into the patient eventually receiving or not receiving the product at all. Just to remind uh, those in the audience who may be familiar with this data, uh, in probably most of the studies, there is around 10% of the patients who were intended to receive the product, but never did because of the delays in manufacturing that eventually led to progression of the disease up being one of the main reasons. Obviously, in other reasons like patients changing their mind or so on, but, but certainly progression of the disease is very important. This, this is a disease that is so uh, difficult and refractory that every day counts. And, and I think that those are the criteria that I look at when, when I try to. Uh, others are really the incidence of, of side effects. Uh, some products have a little bit of higher incidence of neurotoxicities or uh, uh, cytokine release syndrome. And those, uh, I would say, with time, we have learn and become much better at and dealing with them. So, but it's kind of an interplay of all of those factors that really you make uh, your eventually final decision on that. So um, I'll ask you, Dr. Peranda, to maybe give us a little bit about how you select one of the two products in multiple myeloma. 
Yes. So it's a, you know, similar to what Dr. Carfan was saying, you know, in myeloma, we have two products, right? And if you look at the separate trials, right, uh, the uh, Karma 1 trial and the Cartitude 1 trial, you know, the the cell from the data from Cartitude 1 of cell, you know, that appears to be a better CAR T, right? But we cannot make that conclusion because the two products haven't been compared head to head, right? So what I what I use is, you know, the manufacturing times, right? Sil to cell takes about eight weeks to manufacture. Ida cell takes about four weeks. You know, it depends on the patient, the pace of the patient's disease. You know, can they wait eight weeks for uh, sil to cell manufacturing? You know, if they're rapidly progressing, progressing, and they cannot wait, you know, I will go with the Ida cell product. Because every patient deserves to get at least, you know, one type of BCMA directed therapy. So getting them to CAR T, re- regardless of which one, is the goal. So you use right the the manufacturer, as Dr. Carfan was saying, the manufacturing times, the side effect profile, to tailor it to the specific patient. Excellent. Thanks both of you for giving us a good summary of that. Uh, the other question that we're getting from the audience, again, a very uh, interesting question. Dr. Murthy, I'm going to uh, hand this over to you. So you mentioned about how CAR T cell therapy is being developed and, and uh, targets are being identified for solid tumors. But other kind of uh, uh, convenience or an availability or a possibility for solid tumors is they're solid. Can CAR T cells be injected locally for these solid tumors? So more like an intralesional um, administration. Uh, is there data? What are your thoughts? So it is a it is a very it's a very good question and one that is being looked at in clinical trials. I think one of the one of the examples we know was that uh, I believe mesothelioma. They have done they have done this with direct injection of the car of the car products. Uh, into the plural space. But I think, you know, I think the question becomes, uh, you know, most of the trials when we have these four CAR T have gone beyond single lesion. And, and that's where I think we're still trying to get a handle on metastatic disease. We need to show that these are truly effective in that setting. But there are certainly some aspects where people are looking at indirect injection. I would say mesothelioma is one. Uh, neuro, neurologic is the other, uh, like such as GBM, anything to inject directly into the, into the uh, CNS area. But I think really um, the major focus right now is uh, one, one, not only identifying the target, but getting a handle on why on metastatic disease and and I do think, but there are studies that are looking at uh, particularly. I think there is even one about uh, using CAR T in a in an application uh, post post op for on an on a so to to for margin. So there is definitely uh, a lot of innovation that is being thought of and out there. But I think right now, in terms of major trials, the focus really is on metastatic disease right now. Excellent. Well, thanks a lot for that uh, very well uh, kind of summarized uh, and and a future looking um, thought about CAR T cell therapy. So with that, we'll come to the end of this uh, webinar. And I would really like to thank our panelists for participating in this very interesting and timely discussion. And also to all our audience, for uh, tuning in, listening, and also sending some of their questions to be answered. Clearly, it has uh, stirred an interest. And obviously, from our patient standpoint, all we want is to provide the right therapy and and serve the needs of our patients at the right time. Uh, I thank everybody, and um, uh, I really appreciate uh, your attending this.